I never pass up an opportunity to tell my story um, because I am a kidney recipient. I was transplanted 32 years ago. My uh, brother gave me a kidney and under the direction of my nephrologist and a really close friend, Dr. Periak Mulgrew in San Antonio, we spent a lot of time deciding where I was headed. And where I was headed was for transplant or dialysis and I chose after he gave me the, my options, transplant. So I had two periods of, of uh, dialysis b tr prior to surgery, and that's all the dialysis I had. So I can't speak to you on dialysis, but I can tell you how important transplant is to my life, because I now am, am rollicking and frolicking with my four grandchildren. And I've had a really good career as a registered nurse, working in the VA system and also in the public sector. And I am very proud to be on the board of directors with AAKP. I can't tell you how important that's been to me, but also how important it is to a lot of people who are listening in here. And I speak to them, 32 years is nothing. Everybody should have that opportunity. And I speak to you folks out there that are watching us. Don't give up. So let's get started this, this afternoon. And uh, this is really actually my nap time. So if I pause a little bit, please give me. <laughs> uh, it's indeed an honor to introduce this next panel, Evolutions in Transplantation Today. The panel speakers are leading the way in advancing transplantation to not only help increase the number of transplants, but ensure that once transplanted, these organs remain as healthy as possible for as long as possible. We take out the averages, we want them there as long as possible. To ensure that the patients who receive them trust that their care is available to help monitor the health of their new kidney, but most importantly, to ensure, ensure that those who have the courage to donate, whether in life or death situation, have not done so in vain. We must do all we can to preserve that precious gift. And trust me, I've spent a long time working on that. I would now like to introduce the speakers here today, and especially to my uh, co-monitor, moderator, Dr. Jagadeesan, or Dr. Jag as his patients like to call him. And I'm gonna use that because I can't pronounce his first name. So Dr. Jag is the Associate Professor uh, of Medicine and Section Chief of Transplantation at George Washington U University, and he'll moderate our question and answer section. Our panel speakers today are strong advocates for patient care choice, and choice is a, is a very important word here because it is the patient's choice. In conjunction with the healthcare provider, they are the ones that get the last say, what they're gonna do. There is Dr. John Gill from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and also representing the American Society of Transplantation. Dr. Eric Litchens, a Senior Director of Commercial Operations and Head of Patient Advocacy with Hansa Biopharma. Mr. Joe Muldoon, CEO of FAST, F-A-S-T, Biomedical, and an unapologetic champion of changing the status quo of kidney care to create more care choices for patients. And then Dr. Reginald Situ, the president and chief business officer with CareDX, and a well-known advocate on kidney research and care innovation. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Gill. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It uh, really is an honor and uh, it's somewhat humbling for me to be here to speak to uh, this group. I want to thank uh, Paul and Richard and Dominic for having the vision to put this meeting together. I think this is really special and I think it's the way um, we need to interact as a community in the future. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to give you a potpourri of things and um, because I'm in Washington DC, I'm going to, uh, my research spans health research, uh, everything from clinical trials and so forth. But I'm going to lean a little bit more on the policy side just because of where we are and, and it's a beautiful place to be at this time of year, so thank you again. 
here are my disclosures. Um, I'm the treasurer of the American Society of, the Trans of Transplantation, but my opinions here don't reflect the official policy of the AST. My grant uh, support and consultancies are listed, uh, but importantly, I wanted to highlight that I'm a Canadian. And what that means to me is I've really benefited from the strength of the U.S. Uh, end-stage kidney disease system. You guys have an amazingly organized and detailed system, a world-class registry that's really taught the world in many ways how to practice this. Um, and where, po where possible, um, uh, I've had the ability to share some of the learnings that we have in Canada with my U.S. colleagues, and I hope that that's had some impact on the United States. And importantly, I'm a nephrologist, and, and so I'm not a transplanter. I view myself as a nephrologist, and one of the themes of my talk is, is getting rid of some of the silos and thinking of us as a continuous community that looks after the patient uh, throughout the spectrum of their disease. And so I, I put that as a, as a point of highlighting. Here's an overview of four topics I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the cessation of Medicare's coverage for immunosuppressive drugs and the policy implication is obviously the immuno bill. I'll talk about the fragmentation of dialysis and transplant care and the policy implication there is the Patients Demonstration Act. I'll talk about access to transplantation and I'm going to show you that um, when we rely on the waiting list we really are only capturing a smidgen of the disparities in access that exist. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about care uh, for patients while they wait. It's kind of like, you know, you're in the queue and we forget about you in transplant. Uh, and we're going to talk about um, some innovations that we're doing, actually, to try and improve that. So this, I think, is fairly familiar to this audience. Cessation of Medicare's coverage for immunosuppressive drugs um, really ceases three years after the time of transplantation. And we know that cessation of immunosuppressive drug coverage is associated with premature failure of a kidney transplant. And so as a Canadian, uh, we published this in 2012, um, and we were just drawing an association here looking internationally. And I do think there are some limits to international comparisons, but here what we were obviously pointing out is that the U.S. is alone among developed countries in not paying uh, for essential life-saving medications. And that then has an impact um, on outcomes, which if I can get the pointer to work, you can see here uh, there's a significant difference in five-year survival and 10-year survival in the United States compared to other countries uh, that you see listed there, including my own. Now, we also generated some data to substantiate uh, that sort of loose association that I showed you on the first slide. And what you're looking at here is survival for a deceased donor kidney uh, recipient and a living donor kidney recipients. Um, and what you're comparing is, is patients who are insured by Medicare, meaning these are the patients for whom uh, immunosuppressive coverage would end at three years, and patients who were privately insured or not insured by Medicare. And you can see that there's a difference in these two groups right from the time of transplantation, but the point of this slide is to show you that this difference widens at the three-year time point. So there's an interaction that happens in this splay. It's more obvious here in the living donor curve in the graph that this splay gets wider. And again, the implication is, is, is that um, not having access to medications may have a role in this. Now, we wrote that in the New England Journal in 2012, and naively we thought it might have some impact, and of course it didn't, and I think many in this room are frustrated by that as well. So we decided to write to perhaps a more powerful voice, which is the Washington Post. And so my, my colleague and friend, Dr. Tonelli, who's at the University of Calgary, and I know, wrote this editorial, which was in the Washington Post, again, drawing issue to this. And people always ask me, why do you care as a Canadian? And I care because I see the difference that it has on patient outcomes. So, as you know, uh, there's been the development of generic immunosuppressive drugs, which I think has finally uh, perhaps renewed the possibility that uh, there could be a legislative breakthrough on this space. And many of you are probably aware of this briefing, which just came out, actually, which looked at the costs, um, and this was pr uh, pr uh, put out by the Department of Health and Human Services. And you can see that this is, to me, a fairly modest cost saving, actually, over 10 years. I actually think it would probably be bigger than that. Um, but I want to show you some data that we're generating right now, and this is with a young guy that works with me named Matthew Kaditz. I'm treating him in health economics, and this is uh, um, a manuscript that's currently under review and we hope is, is published very soon, so I'm going to show you some unpublished data here. 
And what we're looking at is, is um, on the x-axis, the quality adjusted life years that you would glean, and this is the cumulative cost uh, of producing that. This is the current policy where cessation of, of immunosuppressive drug coverage ends at three years. And one of the challenges with this type of health economic analysis is, is what do you compare it to? Um, so what's the magnitude of benefit you'll get if you do extend immunosuppressive drug coverage? That's a very hard thing to estimate for two reasons. Number one, there'll never be a controlled trial of necessarily withdrawing patients from their immunosuppression to actually get that estimate. And similarly, from observational data, you can understand that ascertaining that information from patients where, you know, uh, about medical non-adherence with their prescription medications is hard to get. And so that estimate is different to generate. And so what we did here was we said, if we could, if we could extend Medicare coverage um, and you made the outcomes equivalent to those of a privately paid patient, in this scenario, paying for immunosuppression is dominant. That means it generates more qualities at lower costs an absolute no-brainer. And so if you, accept, if you accept that scenario, that's what you would say. If you said it's going to improve things by 75% of that, um, so getting people up to 75% of what they would get to if they had, were privately insured, you can see that this is nearly cost neutral. Uh, the incremental cost for quality is only $9,000. I'd put it to you that, you know, uh, 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 thresholds that are acceptable for payment are well in excess of $100,000. So that basically is a wash. And if you say very conservatively you want it to be 50% of the benefit, it, this, the uh, incremental cost is still very acceptable at only $77,000. So there's no doubt in my mind after doing this very careful analysis uh, with US data um, that this is cost of, uh, at the very least cost effective if not cost saving. So I'm hopeful uh, that we do see a breakthrough in this space. And these are the inputs that went into the model. What I just showed you is generated from what's called a Markov model. There's a number of inputs. And what this is is a tunnel plot that just shows you whether these uh, findings are robust if you vary these things. So at the very top, I'll just go through one of them in the interest of time. If the cost of dialysis increases uh, uh, in, in red, you can see that the baseline savings, which is $20,000 per quality, uh, actually improve, which you'd expect. And so you can see at no place does this become um, uh, more expensive. You can see that this is zero on this end. So this is very robust to plausible variations in factors that could drive this model. The next theme I want to touch on is fragmentation of dialysis and transplant care. There's a real buzzword now about integration of care. Um, and I think this is a problem uh, for us. Uh, we operate in silos. This is very old data that uh, we generated. Um, which just shows you mortality per 100 patient years at three different time uh, points in the lifespan of a patient um, uh, with uh, end-stage kidney disease. And what you see here is, is as you wait on the waiting list, your mortality goes up. And then when you transplant patients, this is the safest play to be, but we have a problem with the handoff here. If we were a relay team, we wouldn't even finish the race. You can see here that we have a high perioperative mortality. And again, then when the graft fails and people go back on dialysis, we have this huge blip when people return to dialysis after transplant failure. So we're not very good and we would make a poor relay team in terms of working with our dialysis colleagues in ensuring continuity of care. So that's old data. Let me flip a little bit now. And of course, I'm a Canadian. I can't resist doing some Canadian-US comparisons. This is an old study from my colleague Joe Kim, who's at the University of Toronto which we were working on uh, together. And you can see here that we're looking at patient survival after transplantation. And what you're, what you're seeing here is, 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 is that mortality among Canadian patients um, is, is, is lower than that among US uh, patients who get a kidney transplant. Okay, that might be related to our fresh air or the fact that we love hockey or whatever. Um, but the interesting thing was, was that variation got, was more dramatic based on the duration of exposure to dialysis prior to the transplant. So if you consider a, a Canadian patient having a hazard ratio of one, you can see that the risk of death um, uh, in US patients was exaggerated in patients who'd waited longer uh, to get their transplant, suggesting that dialysis exposure has something to do with the post-transplant outcome. And that, of course, then is, brings us to this slide, which is data we never published because nobody cared about the dialysis exposure relationship to post-transplant outcomes in Canada at the time. That we presented this, you can see, at ATC in 2010. 
And the point of this slide is, 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 is that there are some differences. So the longer patients are on dialysis prior to transplant, it does have a small, very small impact on post-transplant outcomes in the Canadian setting. And this is surprising because if I was to put up a curve of this in the United States, these separations as a function of dialysis exposure would be much greater. There would be a much greater splay. And so I'll show you that in a second here. And so this got us to thinking, well, okay, that's Canada again. What the heck are people going to do with that? And so we just looked at a good old map from the United States Renal Data System. This is work that Stephanie Clark, who's a PhD uh, researcher in my group and I are working on right now. And it's a fact that dialysis mortality, depending on where you reside in the United States, varies significantly. This is not surprising uh, 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 to this audience. But the interesting, so their hypothesis was, well, does that then marry with post-transplant outcomes? And of course, I'm, I'm uh, you know, spoiler alert, of course it does. And so in this slide, you can see that. So here on the, on the far side, the first thing I'm just showing you is that longer dialysis is associated with a higher incidence of graft loss um, on this slide. And then what I'm seeing, showing you here is, is we've just grouped the sort of dialysis mortality uh, by state into quartiles, and you can see that these things separate out. What's cool here is if you put these two things together in these three-dimensional graphs where you look at a function of uh, the dialysis environment, if you will, or the quartile of mortality about where you get dialysis and the time you spent on dialysis, you can see that there's an interaction here. So the longer you're on dialysis, the higher your rate of, of allograft failure. But if you dialyze in a place that has a higher dialysis mortality, that impact on post-transplant uh, survival is also greater. And you can see this for whether you censor for uh, death as the cause of transplant failure. But here you see it in patient survival where it's very dramatic. This is, again, um, the lowest area, the lowest uh, uh, states with the lowest uh, dialysis mortality. This is dialysis exposure, and you can see how this goes way up. So what we do to our patients on dialysis has a durable impact uh, on, on their post-transplant outcomes. And so we can't be siloed off in terms of our care. Um, and so for me, the policy implications here are pretty obvious. I, I don't need to go through them here. But uh, I think this issue with where we're divided administratively by paying uh, resources is inappropriate, and we need to figure out a better way to do things. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is, is access to kidney transplantation. And so the first thing that you should be aware of is that the waiting list in the United States, which has you know, be a, been a plague, uh, you know, something that we really are, 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 are uh, struggling with, is actually going down in the United States. So is that a good thing? Um, and so this is just data that shows you that. And the answer is it's probably complicated. So why is the waiting list decreasing in the last little while? And I hope these slides light up. The first thing is, as you can see, is, is that patients are being removed um, uh, uh, increasingly over time. And so that, to me, is concerning. When we look at the reasons why patients are being removed from the waiting list, these things, two things pop up at the bottom. They're either considered too sick for their transplant or there's this nebulous other reason which is, you know, hard to define. But that, to me, is, is, should be concerning. So patients are being removed from the waiting list, not necessarily for transplantation, the other issue is, is why is the waiting list decreasing? Are we adding patients to the waiting list at the same rate we have? And you can see that this is relatively stagnant. We haven't really uptaked the number of patients. And this is then reflected in these slides where you look at access to transplantation over time, and you can see that it's dropping for patients who are treated with dialysis. So this is becoming increasingly inaccessible. We heard that only 3% of patients uh, uh, ever uh, uh, achieve a transplant. And you can see that this is across all age groups. So this is something that we ought to be concerned about. But the real point here is that the waiting list, in my view, is a useless indicator of the true need for transplantation. And this is going to get worse as, as the policy changes that have happened now where you can now backdate people to their dialysis start date. That's a good thing in terms of uh, decreasing disparities, but it means that the waiting list isn't going to be an accurate indicator of the need for transplantation. We should be concerned about that. So if we think about the steps a patient has to go through to access a transplant, there are multiple. The first thing is, is you have to be referred to a transplant center. The second thing is, is you have to complete the transplant workup. Then you have to be accepted by the center onto their waiting list. And then you have to survive the waitlist period and finally you, you get a deceased donor transplant. 
And as I've shown you with the bracket there, we have no national data on those first three steps. And that's a problem. And that recommendation's been out there actually for more than 15 years in the United States. So here's some good Canadian data to show you that this is a problem north of the border as well. This is a paper that'll be out in Jason. And what we did is, is we don't collect this information either, but we did it for three years solid. And the primary thing I'm showing you here is just by province. Kidneys aren't routinely shared across provincial borders. Um, and so we have these regions in which we routinely share kidneys and they're color coded there. They basically line up with, program, with provinces. So BC is responsible for the Yukon because there's hardly anybody up there. But nonetheless, you can see that there's a threefold variation in referral among incident end stage kidney disease patients to transplantation in the Canadian setting. Um, and so we think this is an important issue. Um, and the, the two major things that were coming out of this paper is saying is that national reporting of referral for transplantation is needed. We need to know who is and is not being referred. It's the first step in gaining access to a transplant. And the second thing is, is we need standardization of processes. There's a great heterogeneity and subjectivity uh, that potentially exists in who is or is not referred. In the last couple of minutes here, um, um, I want to talk about management of waitlisted patients. Um, and again, I'm going to show you this, this, uh, this slide which shows you when do our patients die. And again, highlight the fact that at the time of transplantation, we have this high perioperative mortality uh, that we're concerned about. Um, and why does that happen? Most of this is due to cardiovascular disease. This is looking at the same thing. And you can see that in yellow, we're looking at post-transplant mortality as a function of time post-transplant um, for either a deceased donor recipient or a living donor recipient. You can see this inflection uh, or increase in incidence that's primarily related to myocardial infarction, okay? And so this has been well recognized for a long time. And so what the transplant community concocted was uh, clinical practice recommendations that weren't necessarily evidence-based. These were devised by uh, Chuck Herzog, who's at the University of Minnesota, who's actually uh, uh, a consultant for us on a study that we're doing to address this. But basically, we came up with these recommendations, and what they said was, was we should test people for occult cor uh, coronary artery disease before we wait list them, and you can see the frequency with which we should do it. And then while they're waiting, we should do it every one or two years, depending upon their risk profile. These are in patients who are completely otherwise asymptomatic. Um, and the important thing is, is, is since the time of those recommendations, the world has moved on. The management of uh, silent coronary artery disease has evolved dramatically in cardiology. And so surgical intervention is not really something that's put up as the first thing that you would do. And you can see when you look at the American Heart uh, 2007 recommendations for patients who are going for an otherwise elective intermediate risk surgery, like a kidney transplant would be, they basically say that if the patient can exercise for four METs, which is basically climbing a flight of stairs, um, uh, you are good to go ahead with the surgery and you don't need to necessarily screen patients who other, are otherwise having uh, no symptoms. And so that is recognized as being dichotomous with what we do in kidney transplantation. Now, of course, some of our considerations are different. We're trying to obviously um, uh, not just get the person through the perioperative period, which is the main goal of of, of uh, non-transplant uh, surgical screening, but we also don't want to uh, compromise a precious resource, i.e. a donated kidney. Um, but this was recognized by this export uh, panel, um, and they graded uh, the recommendations that we had, and of course, the first recommendation didn't very have uh, very much evidence, but the second one, which was periodic screening of people while they wait on the waiting list, was really uh, challenged as something that maybe we shouldn't be doing. And so we did a lot of work and we, there was no equipoise on, on whether to screen people um, or not at the time of waitlisting, but people were willing to randomize patients um, after they were on your waiting list and you'd already sort of evaluated them to screening or no screening. And so that's where we got to. We said, so what should we do? And we came to doing a clinical trial. And the first question really was, well, what is a clinical trial ethical? Um, this notion that screening is a good thing 
uh, you know, took a lot of uh, convincing to get people to say, oh, it actually could be harmful, and here's the reasons why it could be harmful. The biggest issue is, is if you pop up with a positive non-invasive screening test on my waiting list, that means you're going to be put on hold probably close to a year before we sort it out and get you back active, and that's a big problem. And so there are potential harms for screening otherwise asymptomatic patients. And so once we convinced the community of that, we were able to fund this trial in Canada and the United States. Um, and this is going to be the biggest cardiology trial in, in this space in kidney transplantation ever. Um, and the hypothesis really is, is, is once somebody's on your waiting list, is screening necessary? So patients are randomized to regular screening as per standard of care recommendations or not unless they develop symptoms. Um, and that's just basically shown for you here. Obviously, if patients get symptoms, they can uh, be investigated as per their center would normally do this. And it's a, a MACE outcome, so we're looking at major adverse cardiac events as well as time of tr to transplantation. And so if you like Seinfeld, this is a trial about doing nothing. Getting big trials funded now is very, very difficult. And so if you think about the intervention here, we're actually taking away an expensive practice which may actually be harmful for patients. And that was key to getting this trial funded. So getting complex trials, I'm looking at Dr. Kimmel, is very, very challenging. And, and in fact, we don't have enough money to do this trial in the United States. As I showed you, the US is not participating in this. So what do we expect from this? This trial will enroll 3,300 patients in Canada, Australasia, and now we've added Spain and Germany. We hope to disseminate the results to our US colleagues, and we have a partnership with um, United Health Group uh, to do this for a knowledge translation perspective. Irrespective of this, out of whatever the trial shows, it will do one of two things. Either, either validate our current practices, which are now becoming less well uh, implemented as people are influenced by what's happening in general cardiology, or it will say that this is something we should not continue to do. And you can see that the potential cost savings are over $300 million a year. That's, an es that's a conservative estimate based on the number of patients on the waiting list. So I'll summarize here. I've given you a potpourri of things. I couldn't resist the policy implication things. But the point of this uh, type of research that I've shared with you here is to let you know that not everything is a basic device or a immunosuppressive drug trial. So much of what we do um, uh, is based on health services research, and that research really needs to be funded, uh, and we need to have good knowledge translation tracks for that to be enacted into policy. So I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. So my name is Eric Litchens. I'm the head of patient advocacy for a company called Hansa Biopharma. Um, my presentation today will be on uh, transplantation in highly sensitized patients and the remaining unmet needs in that category. Um, throughout the presentation, you will see uh, images of people. These are actual patients and actual caregivers that have given us the permission to use the images. They all participated in uh, creating the corporate template that I will be using, um, and I thought it would be good to give a little bit more face to what we're, what we're doing here. So as I said, Hansa Biopharma is a Swedish biopharmaceutical company. It's clinical stage uh, and based in Lund. Um, I myself am not Swedish, I'm Dutch. I'm from the Netherlands, um, just to... <laughs> a lot of people think that I'm Swedish. Uh, we <laughs> um, approximately, we have approximately 60 employees worldwide. Uh, we have operations also, small operations in the US. Uh, the company was founded in 2007, and our focus is not so much on rare diseases, but very much on rare patients. And as Paul said it yesterday, patients for us are at the center of their own care. So that's why we wanted to focus on the patient one by one, uh, and not on the rare diseases. So our pipeline is based on an immunomodulatory enzyme platform that has the potential to reduce specific immune responses. And we'll get, get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Happy birthday! So it's, an especi it's a special year for AKP, and it was a special year for one of my colleagues, the lady at the center in there with the flower jacket. Uh, she was actually born in the year that the AKP was founded, and she thought it was really appropriate that when we had cake for her birthday, that we would record this little message as a, it's maybe a little bit early, but as a congratulations to, to AKP for, for the 50th anniversary. Uh, 
So what I'm here to talk about today is addressing a significant unmet need. And it's not significant because of the large number of patients that it, uh, that it, uh, that it addresses, that, sorry, the large number of patients that it involves, but it's for those patients that are affected by the unmet need, it's a very significant something. So I want to talk about HLA sensitization, so human leukocyte antigen sensitization, which can be a significant immunological barrier to kidney transplantation, purely from the risk for the, because of the risk for uh, an immune or hyperrejection. Um, and in those cases, desensitization may be warranted. Um, these, so patients with high levels of, uh, so high, who are highly sensitized, have high levels of donor-specific antigens, uh, that reduces the likelihood of a successful uh, transplantation, so a successful match, and these patients face prolonged waiting times on the waiting list. So these patients are more likely to remain on long-term dialysis, uh, and as we know, uh, so long-term dialysis may lead to or may increase m mortality, and what we see combined in Europe and in, uh, and in the US, about 9,000 patients per year die whilst on the, on the transplant wait list. So I talked about antibodies and sensitization. So an antibody is a protein molecule produced by the immune system when a foreign, either a protein or a virus particle or an organ or a piece of tissue is introduced into the, introduced into the body and the immune, res the immune system responds to that by producing antibodies. So in the case of uh, transplantation, so when an organ or piece of tissue is introduced in the human's body, then these, bo these antibodies are called donor-specific antibodies. So there are several ways that they can react with the immune system, so, but whatever the way is, it will lead to rejection reaction, and that's something that you would like to, um, to prevent. So things that could also lead to, donor -specific, to the raising donor-specific antibodies is a blood transfusion, or a pregnancy or a previous failed, uh, failed graft. So the, the more times this happens, the higher the antibody levels become and the more difficult it becomes to match, uh, to find a matching kidney, uh, donor kidney. So in, in general, sensitized candidates wait three to four times longer than unsensitized patients for compatible disease donor kidney. So longer on the waiting list, longer on dialysis. <coughs> So, but if you know that, that there is a problem, you also want to quantify the problem. So, whilst on the waiting list, there is a way of measuring the level of sensitization, and you do that with a panreactive antibody test, by which you test the human antibodies in the blood. So, it gives you an idea of what kind of anti so antigens you're going to react to as a, as a donor, and so there's a score, and that's expressed in a percentage, and it ranges from 0 to 99%. And the higher the score is, the more different kind of antibodies, donor-specific antibodies, are present. So for instance, uh, uh, if you have a PRA of 20%, it means that you have antibodies to approximately 20% of the general population. So, <coughs> so by that, so if you take one step further, you say the calculated PRA calculates the likelihood of that the recipient and the donor would be incompatible. And so that would translate to an increase in waiting time. So the higher your CPRA, the higher your potential waiting time is because the more, the, 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 the chance of finding a matching kidney is much lower. And if you then look at the table over here, so we look at the CPRA going from 10 to 99.999%, you see a lo logarithmic increase. So if you have a CPRA, the theoretical number of kidneys that you would need in order to find a matching kidney would be two. But you see that it goes with, with the CPRA going up, you see that the theoretical number of kidneys that you need in order to find a matching kidney goes up very, very steep. So if you would be looking at a CPRA of 99.5%, you would need around 600 kidney offers in order to be able to find a match. But with a CPRA of close to 100, it would increase to 300,000. And if you think that only 20,000 kidneys per year are being transplanted, that's gonna take a really long time before you get there. So there are things that will increase the probability of finding a match, and will, there are things that, that will decrease the probability of finding a match. So P, uh, PRA is one of the things that will decrease the, uh, the probability of finding a match, but things like priority programs will increase the probability of finding a match. So if you give priority dose to those who have a high CPRA, 
then the probability of finding a match increases. And that was one of the things that the CAS system, with its introduction in 2014, was set out to do. So what you're looking at, at the y-axis, is the standard deviation of access to transplant score. And what that actually means is that there's a higher variance based, if you look at CPRA, which is the green line, the upper line here, so CPRA introduces a lo potentially longer waiting time for a lot of patients before CAS was introduced. And what you see then when CAS was implemented in 2014, the contribution of CPRA to the standard deviation of the access to transplant actually decreased dramatically. Whereas most of the other factors, so age and blood group and donor service area, remain pretty much the same. So with the introduction of the kidney allocation system, um, CPRA, so the contribution of CPRA to the waiting time has been decreased overall. But if we then look at specific subpopulations, so here we have uh, the overall group of 99 to 100%, then subdivided 99.5 to 99.9%, 99% and 99.9 and above, so close to 100% CPRA. You see that before the introduction of CAS, the transplant um, rate was very low, and that you see a bolus effect as soon as the CAS came into place, which tapered off a little bit, but for the overall group, it increased quite significantly. Most of the contribution, however, is, the, is because of the group of the 99.5 to 99.9% CPRA uh, transplants, whereas that you see that for the, for the even higher sensitized group, there was an increase, but not to the extent that you see with the, the, the slightly lower CPRA. So if we then look <coughs> at, at, in a different way, so this is, these are the transplant rates corrected for years on, tra on, uh, on the transplant list per subgroup of CPRA, so per 10%. You see that the highest bump before the introduction of gas was around 80%, and you see that shift to the 99.95%. Uh, so that's a market increase. So much more access to transplant was given to those with a high level of CPRA. However, the group with the highest CPRA levels remained, compared to the, to the other groups, significantly lower. It went up a little bit, but you see that there's pretty much an equal distribution apart from a few groups like the, the uh, close to 100%, but the highest group still has sees a lower number of transplants uh, per year. So what I'm trying to say is that there's still a group that for which the CAS has not been able to give, even though you've got priority, to, to result in a, in a successful transplant. So as I said, so kidney allocation system has given priority to people with 99 to 100% CPRA. Um, whilst that is the case, the 99.9% and higher group has not, for them, it has not increased to the extent as for the overall group. So people in this group really face an IgG immunological barrier that uh, delays their access to transplant significantly. So at the moment, there are no approved therapies or uh, therapeutic options to remove donor-specific antibodies for these patients. And there are a few institutions that have uh, institutional protocols to remove these donor-specific antibodies. But whilst it provides an option for some patients, these are therapeutic protocols that take a long time. People have to really commit to it. It's very invasive for them. These protocols typically have an application in living donor situations, so not so much in the deceased donor situation, because purely from a time perspective. So why am I here today? So as I said, we have an immunomodulatory platform based on enzymes, and one of the enzymes that we're working on is an inv investigational IgG degrading enzyme in lipidase. So what lipidase does is specifically cleave um, IgG, so not IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, or IgE, and the enzyme is derived from Streptococcus pyogenes, and it's, so it's strep throat in essence. And the bacterium has developed a mechanism that by, whilst it infects us, it makes its opportunistic chances or increases its opportunistic chances by cleaving our IgG to a certain extent. So a couple of years ago, somebody thought, what if, what if we would <coughs> purify the, the, the enzyme, the endopeptidase, and use that to cleave IgG uh, completely? So what we, what we saw is that it leaves all forms of IgG, so all subclasses in vitro, free bound to antigen and B cell receptor. Um, and it, that it also, so it does it also for all circulating IgG. 
um, it's a two-step cleavage reaction. So it cleaves in the hinge region between the FABA2 part and the FC receptor part in a two-step process. And by doing that, it inhibits all FC-mediated activities. So the idea behind it is that it would create a window of opportunity to transplant um, an, an organ where there's a high immunological risk, so a high risk of hyperrejection. The good news is, is that, in essence, all IgG is continuously produced, so this is just a temporary window during which you could potentially uh, transplant. And that's a little bit my story for today. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Muldoon. I'm very fortunate to work for a company uh, named Fast Biomedical. I want to thank Kent for his uh, kind words earlier, and I want to thank all of the AAKP leadership for inviting us here today. Um, I get to work with really smart doctors and regulators and academics, but our favorite group of people to interact with is always patients, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today. I did get nominated to uh, unveil to you that you are part of a medical trial right now, right this very moment. Our hypothesis was that we could reverse the aging process if we lowered your body temperature about 15 degrees <laughs> for at least one conference day. So tomorrow, if you feel two days younger, uh, please report back to us. Um, what I'll talk to you about is what we're doing and what we think the role could be, particularly in transplant medicine. Uh, what I would suggest to you is that for precision medicine to work in transplant, we really need to advance very specific, precise metrics uh, that are clinically viable. And we think we've got a couple of those in measuring kidney function and fluid status. Um, our company's based in Carmel, Indiana. It's about a five iron north of Indianapolis. We're privately held, and we started advancing discoveries that they had at Indiana University School of Medicine. Our technology is a first-in-class technology. We believe it is the first clinically viable way to get an accurate volume measurement and an accurate kidney function measurement. Uh, we're actually measuring it, so it moves us past the current clinical standards uh, of surrogate measurements, which are often crude and insensitive and have a lot of limitations I'll walk you through. Uh, today on the kidney function side, we have estimated glomerular filtration rate. That's why you see the little, the little E in front of all the clinical data that's presented. What we're trying to get us to is measured glomerular filtration rate. Uh, estimated GFR is based on serum creatinine, which has a lot of limitations we'll walk you through. And on the volume side, uh, we rely on estimates of fluid responsiveness to determine volume. Uh, the FDA has determined that this technology meets the requirements for an expedited review. We've been very blessed with substantial NIH support today, and it is an investigational product not yet approved for human use. The problem uh, today with estimates of kidney function are we catch renal dysfunction too late, making it nearly impossible to time therapy to work. We underdose and overdose renally cleared drugs and nephrotoxic drugs because we don't know what your renal clearance really is. And um, this is uh, particularly impactful in dosing antibiotics uh, in the critical care ward. Uh, clinical trials for renal therapies have traditionally been very difficult to conduct uh, with endpoints of death and dialysis, and uh, having a measured GFR in the tool set might be a, a very useful uh, component to future clinical trials. Um, serum creatinine is a trailing indicator. It's fairly slow to respond, especially in, a, in acute injury. Uh, it's days late, and it's plus or minus 30% from actual. So to give you one example, uh, as in this example patient, we're watching the serum creatinine to rise as an indicator that your renal function is actually going down, and you can see a relatively slow rise that actually took a day before it even started to, to tick up. 
Uh, that data is taken and it's run through the best formulas to estimate your GFR and it will come up with an estimate that looks something like this, stable for the first day and then a nice slow decline, when in reality what the measured GFR tells you is that the kidneys took a hit, uh, your function went through the floor uh, and stayed there, but the marker can't pick this up because it's so slow to react. Um, this is some data on CKD epi, which you're probably familiar with, uh, uh, believed to be better equation uh, to take and, and estimate GFR. It's just our observations are um, these data points are extremely widespread around the mean. And with an estimate being plus or minus 30% of what the actual is, you can get an eGFR of 50 and your MGFR is actually 35, which means severe disease, or it might actually be 65, which means you're in stage two chronic kidney disease. There's a big difference between 35 and 65, and the EGFR in that case is a 50. Um, EGFR is accurate across a population, which is what this data proves, but it can be very inaccurate for any individual patient. Uh, we believe that a measured GFR is needed for personalized precision medicine in kidney disease. On the volume status side, uh, when we talk to clinicians and we talk to hospital administrators, uh, the vast majority of them find that a direct measurement of volume would be extremely helpful. The current standard of care for volume assessment uh, does not exist. Uh, we have a lot of technologies that we use, Swans, GANs, catheters, echocardiograms, hemodynamic monitors. We track urine inputs and outputs. But with all those technologies, the go-to technology for clinicians is, is clinical exam, is, is physically looking at patients. And if they're bloated, we assume they're volume overloaded. And if they look deflated, we assume they're volume underloaded. What our technology does is uh, it's an injectable and inert marker that we call VFI. Uh, we've developed it, it's patented, and we give patients a very small dose of it, uh, three milliliters in solution, bolus dose. Um, it mixes in their vasculature and we take a timed blood draw at 15 minutes. We process that sample in our device and we can calculate that patient's blood volume. What clinicians love about it is once you dose a patient, you can actually get as many blood volume measurements as you want over the next six hours because the marker stays resident in their vasculature sufficient enough to do that. On the kidney function side, once we've dosed you with the VFI, it also gives us the ability to calculate your kidney function, but we need two more blood draws over 170 minutes because we're trying to determine your renal clearance. If you can measure renal clearance and you already have a measurement of volume, you can calculate a measured glomerular filtration rate. Uh, our medical device development, uh, we have a device complete. We're putting it right now in what we hope will be its final commercial form. We'd like to have that completed before the start of a pivotal study. Um, it will be lab-based. We were trying to lower the cost burden as much as possible for hospitals that wanted to be able to measure uh, a volume and kidney function. And this also gives us a platform to migrate to a fully automated fluorescence device down the road if the clinicians determine they want to pull it out of the lab and get it closer to the bedside of the patient. There's a rendering of it, and I put it up just because it took us a long time to get here. I'm quite proud of it. It's very beautiful, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, most important slide in the deck, so how might this impact patients? For transplant patients specifically, we think it has the promise for better evaluation of living donors. Uh, and you heard it earlier in the day about the potential of more sensitively being able to analyze living donors both before they give the organ and, and then after they've given it. Uh, better evaluation of renal patients. EGFR tends to overestimate function which creates the potential for a delay in a transplant referral. Um, it improves the, specific, the specificity of dosing of immunosuppressants. So as you know, immunosuppressants are nephrotoxic. So ironically, if the patient doesn't get enough of them, the body might try and kill the organ. If we give them too much of them, the drug might try and kill the organ. And so it will really help you titrate that dose of this renally uh, cleared compound because it gives you renal clearance. 
Um, more broadly, uh, for all renal patients, uh, we think it'll be the first technology ever that will give us the ability to measure renal reserve. So not only what, what's your function uh, right now, but what's your capacity for function, which gives us the ability to identify risk of progression. Uh, a better endpoint for clinical trials, a better way to detect early onset and stage patients for treatments and trials. For end-stage renal disease patients, we think the volume measurement can help establish a dry weight that gives you the ability to manage volume better because now we're measuring it a lot of times by weight and that's a pretty uh, crude way to guide taking off fluid uh, and the potential to delay end stage renal disease by better management of chronic kidney disease. Uh, for us, our clinical history, uh, we've completed three human trials right now. We're through phase two. In the totality of those, we've dosed 97 patients. We've done our clinical work in Western Europe and in the U.S. Uh, we've had good results. The injectable has been well tolerated. Uh, we've shown that we have an accurate, repeatable, and, and sensitive measurements on what we're trying to do, and we've hit our primary and our secondary endpoints. Um, some of this data has now been recently published. Uh, the kidney function data was published in JSON. Uh, we compared to IOHEXAL clearance, a pretty well-known research gold standard, but not really uh, very viable clinically because it takes so long to get the results and it's fairly cumbersome to use. But we showed across all different levels of function uh, 0.9961 uh, correlation to IOHEXAL clearance. So we think we've got a really accurate measurement here. On the volume side, uh, this has just been published in cardiorenal medicine. And what we're able to show is we're able to take all different types of patients and precisely measure a uh, fluid volume challenge. Uh, we were also able to show uh, really strong repeat reproducibility. Our next steps, uh, we are currently in a fourth trial. Um, the country of Germany approached us about doing a subset of a long-term 10,000 patient trial they're doing. So we're doing 50 uh, heart failure patients right now. And as of Friday, we've dosed 24 of those. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we've also uh, designed and submitted uh, what we think will be our final pivotal trial for approval. And we'll be meeting uh, with uh, FDA on that. Uh, and we're also out raising capital. So we think uh, post-closing our next financing round, we're probably about 33 months from having this available in the market. Uh, we've been really blessed by um, involving the best of the best on the key opinion leader clinician side, uh, experts in critical care, heart failure, uh, cardiorenal nephrology from, from literally around the world. And uh, I'll kind of shift a bit from our technology and just a, a challenge I see overall uh, in, in the renal marketplace. And, and there were some comments earlier that alluded to it. But as you know about the great work from the Kidney Health Initiative back in 2016, they published a, a very well uh, developed study called the Barriers in Kidney Health. And they focused on one component that there's fewer randomized controls controlled trials than any other internal medicine specialty, producing a limited number of innovative drugs and devices, and they've received less funding from public and private sources compared with other diseases. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a view of that. I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I track the data. And uh, this is a little old. This was middle 2018, but I've looked at the rest of 2018 and even the first quarter of 2019, and the trends are exactly the same. And the trends are there's plenty of venture capital in healthcare. Matter of fact, we're like setting new records every year. The amount of venture capital is going up. The funds are getting bigger in healthcare. But when you look about where it's going, when you look on the drug side, oncology leads, leads the pack by a lot, goes down from there. Uh, renal disease is not even is not even even on the on the ticker. Uh, we're way behind. When you look at the device side, same thing. Cardiovascular uh, leads the pack in the uh, area that gets the most uh, device investments. And if you look, dermatology, dermatology devices get more venture healthcare investment than uh, devices focused on kidney disease. We, we have to address and we have to change this trend. Um, 
innovation needs capital to move forward. Uh, in summary, we think we're going to be able to move us from estimates of kidney function uh, to uh, an actual measurement of kidney function that will help usher in some precision medicine in this place. Uh, our kidney function and blood volume technologies could favorably impact the lives of transplant patients and the broader renal care community. Um, accurate and timely measurements of kidney function and blood volume are now in late clinical stage development, so we should be encouraged by that. Uh, but the renal area and kidney disease continues to be grossly underfunded compared to other less pre prevalent and less damaging disease states, which is part of what's stifling innovation. Thank you. Just going to say, I understand this is being streamed live. So, um, good morning to those folks who are from other parts of the world. and. Good evening to other folks who are in other parts of the world and good afternoon to everyone here. Uh, my name is Red Sito. Um, I'm the President and Chief Business Officer of KDX. And on behalf of the company, I'm, I want to say I'm extremely proud and honoured to be here today. You know, for us, this is an amazing opportunity. When we, when we were first approached about this presentation and what was being done between AKP and with GW, we just thought it was an amazing opportunity, particularly when we heard the words innovation, when we heard the words kidney, and we heard the word patient. It was just so meaning for us, for us as a company. And I think with the, with the last presenter, Mr. Muldoon, I mean, hearing about what's happening in this space, or the lack of it, is really a telltale sign. And as I listened to the other presenters, um, you know, Dr. Gill presenting what's happening with the waiting lists and people dying, with the list going down, but people dying, listening to um, the sensitized patients from, you know, Dr. Lichens. This summit is the appropriate forum to really help patients. And I just want to know, besides Ken in the room, are there other patients in the audience? I'm just curious if there are. Okay, great, fantastic. So, so for us um, today at KDX, we want to share a few things. Um, just given the time, I think we're supposed to finish at three, so that gives me five minutes. So I'll try to be as quick as possible. But, but three things. Um, the first is to share what is our mission as a company what drives us. The second is really what we are offering in the field of transplantation. We're 100% dedicated to the field of transplantation. And the third is then to talk about some disruptive technology that we have, which I won't go into full detail because we have a full presentation tomorrow, but just to give you a foray of what that will look like. I don't know if, has anyone in the room heard of KDX? No. Okay, there's a few folks. We've been around for, for 20 years, and I don't know if that's a long time or a short time, but I can tell you, for those the people in the country who've been there for 20 years, it's, it's been a long time. And their absolute focus has been in the field of transplantation. And for us, that's really important, because what we've focused on as a company is to try to bring disruptive innovation. That's the core and the focus of what we've done. We're the leader now today in heart transplant surveillance with a test we called Alamap and with a leader today in kidney transplant surveillance with a test we call Alishore. But it hasn't always been easy going. It's been a long slog, and I'm gonna show you what that's taken. It's really you know, timely with what um, Mr. Muldoon shared, because to really help patients, you really have to be dedicated by a, a real mission. You really have to believe in the space you're in. And I think we're fortunate that as a company, we, we are absolutely, patient-centric, and I think, if I can just call out Greg Quinn, who's our head of sales, I mean, he joined the company, because he's, Greg, do you want to stand up? His, his daughter um, is a heart transplant um, recipient, and that was one of the motivations for joining the company. You'll see in a slide, I just saw a, a photo of one of the patients at our patient care management group. She, she came to one of our presentations, and then she joined the company as a patient care manager. Last week, we had another patient that just joined who received a a kidney pancreas transplant. And so I know that about a third of the audience are patients. I mention this is because you need advocates. You need people such as GWU, you need the AAKP, you need the folks that are presenting here today. You have your doctors, you know who they are, but this is gonna take time. It's gonna take investment, it's gonna take resources, but absolutely more importantly, it's gonna take commitment. And I know that because every day we, we live this. And it, I'll just share a couple of things. This, this is what we call our patient guest speakers. Every single meeting, I'm running, a, I'm actually flying back 
uh, after this meeting to California to run our town hall, but every single town hall we have every month, we have a patient, a patient speaker share their journey to the audience. And we do this because we have so many new people joining our company, we want them to hear about the patient. It's absolutely important for them to know what our mission is. In addition to this, we actually have a patient advocacy group where this year we had this um, symposium held out of Brisbane, California, and some of you may recognize your faces in the room, but this is the patient here that I mentioned that, uh, probably in the middle of Christina, she can't quite reach it, but after she heard what we did as a company, she, she joined us. She left her job and she joined us. And I think you, you, you need a company, you need people who join that company, and you need offerings that really will bring innovation. That's why it's so important for us. We also have, I think, that was mentioned um, by Dr. Gill about the Immuno Bill. We have, we have no true benefit by supporting the Immuno Bill. We're not an RX company, but we believe in the transplant patient. We believe the transplant patient should receive immuno, you know, immunosuppressant therapies after three years. So we're spending you know, more than a million dollars investing in you know, a policy group on the Hill. We're investing in dedicated full-time people. I think you'll see Jenny Sato here today. And actually helping support this bill. We, have, we actually have policy advisors, um, we have other folks that we've engaged from agencies, and it's great to see this momentum happening. And again, we're not a direct beneficiary, but we believe the patient will be. And this is something that we as a company believe it's so important that I know that you know, it's often hard getting on, on above a cause that you're not directly related in in some ways, but we believe so much that it was so important for our CEO to fight for this and I, I want to share that with the audience here today. So leading into that, what's our vision? We, we really want to be you know, your partner, the transplant partner for the patient and for the ecosystem. It's, it's very simple, right? We're 100% dedicated to transplant, and we want to work with you. At the same time, our mission is really how can we help improve the outcomes? Everything you'll hear about the company is how can we improve the outcomes of that organ or that graft so again, we want to lead to better outcomes, and as a company, we now have invested in what we call better matching, which is the pre-transplant side of business, as well as the surveillance, which is the post-transplant side of business as well. This is something we presented to the board of directors, and you, you can see the word conceptual. So when you go to a board, or I don't know who's, on a, who's worked in a public company or private company and you know, other companies, but you have boards. And, and when you go to the boards, you, you want to have a pretty good story, you want to have facts. And we went to the board and said, this is what we want to do. We want to get better outcomes, and we're going to do it three ways. One is improving for the organ, the immunomodulation. That is, there's a lot of patients that are on immunosuppressives who receive transplants. Do they need to be on that full dose? Can they be modulated? We believe they can. The second is compliance and adherence. We've, we've hired more than, you know, 15 people now to help ensure that we can improve compliance and adherence in patients who receive testing. The third thing is standardization and um, personalization. We heard about precision medicine from Mr. Muldoon. That's absolutely critical in what we believe is important, that we can tailor our, our offerings towards individual patients. But at the same time, you know, and Dr. Gill will probably tell you this as well, but at, and I'm a physician as well, that at different centers, different things are done. And we brought forward Two or, three year ago, two or three years ago, an idea which is, can we standardize what we do um, as an organization across the industry and across certain hospitals? And everyone said it was impossible. But we now have 50 of the leading centers. There are 238 kidney transplant centers in the United States, but we have 50 of those centers today using a standardized protocol. And from that, we're gonna have many ideas how we can treat patients better. This is absolutely critical if we wanna improve outcomes. So that's the first part. The second part of my um, talk is really how have we evolved as a company? I mean, 2014, things weren't looking necessarily that great for us as an organization. We had one offering out there. We'd been going for about um, 14 years, um, 15 years at that time point. And so, and so we, we said, how can we do more um, as an organization? We had a new CEO at that time. And so we made multiple bets. We said, we've got so much we can do. Where are we going to put our effort and focus? It's about prioritization. So, what we've been able to do now is evolve into a global company. We're now not only a leader in the field of heart surveillance and heart transplant, but now in kidney transplant. We've invested fully into a pre-transplant business that does full typing with the best disruptive technology that's out there. 
And for us, this is really important for us because now we can go and talk to the centres, now we can talk to patients and say, we really are your partner. But it doesn't stop there because there was a slide that was shown, I think, by um, Chris and also Eric, the, the unmet needs. The unmet needs don't stop. They keep on going, right? I don't think we'd ever be satisfied. There is organ shortages. There are issues with organ matching. And there are certainly issues with how we ensure that we um, manage these organs post-transplant. So for us, the focus is this longitudinal patient care management. I think, Kent, you're really fortunate in, A, your, your brother gave you kidney, but also, secondly, that you've been able to have this organ continue to be very viable, and I think that is so important. But one in five, one in five organs fail in, do you know how many years? Less than 10. In, in, in five years. So not everyone's as lucky as, as Ken here, right? And that's really important to know because unmet needs continue in this field of transplantation. And importantly for us is that we want to lay the foundations to be the leader and to help address longitudinal patient care management. And in the last 12 months, this is what we've done. So I've told you our five-year journey, how we got here to be you know, a global company, how we got to lead in kidney and lung, how we built a transplant, pre-transplant business as well. But what we want to do over the next five years, starting in these next 12 months, is actually expand to other organs. So we've now started our offerings in lung. We want to move along to be a leader in artificial intelligence. And we've just recently announced some, uh, some deals that we've done. done there. We're working with the leading Paris group who actually has the largest database in terms of patient registries. And they've got this new cool technology called the iBox. We want to be the leader in disruptive innovation. You've heard about, uh, or you'll hear about Alishore, which is cell-free DNA. Alamap, which is for heart, is with gene expression profiling. But in our pre-transplant technology, we actually have the leading technology we're coming and launch later this year as well. Innovation is the hallmark of what will make a difference for patient. Investment into innovation is absolutely critical. What we heard from Mr Muldoon, that's not happening. We need more companies that are willing to be absolutely dedicated towards this field. And again, I can't reinforce what GW are doing in AKP. This is so important for us as a, as, as a group that want to make a difference in the field of transplantation. Again, you know, you'll, you'll, if we invite it back next year, you'll hear about how we've moved further in the field of artificial intelligence, because we're actually announcing in the next month some of the work that we're doing in this space um, at the major um, transplantation conference um, in the United States, ATC. Again, I'll just show these are our product offerings. Uh, and if you look at the ones that are boxed, these are things that are going to be launched this year. The ones in green in boxes are things that we've brought in from outside. So we're almost double, doubling the number of offerings that we have as a company within a period of 12 months. Again, we're your partner. We are here because we want to make a difference. So the third part of the presentation, and I'll, I'll go fairly quickly through this because we have a longer presentation tomorrow, is about disruptive technology. This is the hallmark of what we do as a company. And in this particular case, we have technology that we acquired in 2014 and we've tested in thousands of patients. It's a non-invasive test. It's a direct measure of cell injury and it measures cell-free DNA and in this case, donor-derived cell-free DNA. So, Ken, in your, in your case, um, if you were to receive this, this test, we could tell if there was any signs of injury to your kidney. That's how this test works. If it's less than a certain percentage or zero, there's nothing happening. But if there is something happening, this will show up from this test, I'll show. And because it's, it's non-invasive and it's a direct measure of cell injury. And this is incredible technology that was developed specifically for transplant patients. It's not a fly-by-the-night company. These, we have things called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And each one of these was selected specifically for the test so that we could measure in, in transplantation. We also have a ton of people in the field of what we call bioinformatics. And there's all these things called algorithms. And we have, you know, a lot of people working on these sort of measures to give you results of these tests. The reason I measure that is because the fact that Kent had his um, kidney from his brother would mean the algorithm changes, as an example, right? Whether it's living, 
or whether it's deceased, or whether it's related, unrelated. All these measure of inputs have taken time to develop, and it's, it's all been transplant specific, and again, it's taken time. But we're very fortunate, very, very fortunate, that we've been able to bring this disruptive innovation. Within less than 12 months, we've now captured or been involved in 4% of the patients receiving kidney transplants in the United States. We're now in more than 100 centers. And this has provided us, provided us an incredible opportunity to keep on investing in this space and to keep on helping transplant patients. We have expanded as an organization. Um, two years ago, there was 100 people. Last year, there was 200 people. This year, we'll be close to 350 people, right? And a lot of that is going towards research and development. A lot of that is going towards how do we get this patient advocacy news. Um, we've dedicated people towards that line. We have patient care managers. I've just mentioned we've hired another 15 to help with patients. This is, this is all about how we can help in the field of transplantation. So again, tomorrow you're gonna to hear more about this test. I know for time we're gonna be um, you know, relatively... Okay, got you again. All right, so I'm gonna move ahead just for time. Maybe the one thing to mention for patients who have received a transplant, I mean, often you'll receive two, two sorts of tests. I mean, just to make it simple. One will be invasive, one will be non-invasive. One invasive test will be a biopsy, one non-invasive test will be a blood test. And what we know today is creatinine in the field of at least kidney transplantation is a very late marker, a very late marker of damage to kidney. We also know that DSA does not cover acute cellular injury. We also know it's not necessarily an indicator of active injury. We also know with biopsy, um, there are areas where it also can't be read at times, but at the same time, it's very invasive, and there's comorbidity associated with that. So we as a company said, what can we do and develop? And this is where we came with Alishore. Non-invasive test, a direct measure of cell injury. And I'm just gonna show the, the data from our, uh, our significant study called DART. And basically, if you look at serum creatinine, you cannot tell the difference between active rejection and no active rejection. There is no difference in these measures. Using Alishore, you can see for those with no active rejection, what, there's no increase in the cell-free DNA, and those with active rejection where you get the cell-free DNA measures. This is what would bring this innovation. And I think this is so critical that we now have a lead marker that will allow that early detection. Now, in the field of transplantation, all things take time for change, but we believe we're contributing towards that change as well. Again, just to highlight how this works, if there's no active rejection such as Ken, this test won't go up. It's a lead indicator, active rejection at peaks. And then we've seen this also in our studies and also with real treatment of patients thousands of them, that with post-treatment, the cell-free DNA um, levels come down as a measure of improvement. So this is really a great biomarker, and it's a real innovation, and that's why we feel very fortunate that we've been able to bring this disruptive innovation. So I'm going to end off here just for time, but if I have to leave a few words, and I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but really as a company, you know, we're 100% dedicated to transplantation. We think it's so important that the patient comes first. Every single meeting we have starts off with patients, even our presentations. We have real patients, and I don't know if you saw that during the presentation, actually is part of what we have in, in, in what we share with the external world, but also internally. I think for us, the hallmark of bringing change is innovation. I would encourage all the companies that you speak to or um, other investors to, to invest in transplantation. It's an area that really needs help but I think you can make such a big difference. We found that within the last five years we brought change. The next 12 months is gonna bring so much more change. Thank you. Uh, going to the uh, paucity of time, I'm going to limit myself to a comment and then I'll let it go for the questions. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank I, I wanna thank my uh, moderators, John, uh, Reggie, Joe, uh, and uh, Eric, uh, I think I, I feel I'm at an ATC meeting. It went through right from allocation, uh, getting more people transplanted, follow up. This has been phenomenal. The only one, I have a, I have one comment is 
one of the things as a transplant nephrologist I feel is the transplant process for a patient to navigate is still very intimidating, exactly. number one. Exactly. Uh, this is something which I, I think it is, and I think many patients will share. The other thing is, I think we need to have, per we need to be, we need to change the paradigm how we measure success. And I was just talking to John about it. I don't think it's all about one year, five year, and 10 year outcomes, which are very important, but you have to put, I think, patients, the side effects of medications and QOL. Somehow we have to get into a paradigm we need a patient not only for the graft to last, but the patient should have a great quality of life. That needs to be built to it. I think as, as, as an association, as a community of patients, caregivers, um, uh, advocacy groups, we need to reach out to that. With that, I'll let it out to the audience now for questions. So, so sir, thank you. So a couple questions, Dr. Gill. Your data that you showed us about uh, the length of time that a patient is dia on dialysis and um, the, the negative influence that it has on their allograft outcomes. Was that corrected for uh, RBC transfusions that occurred during that period? What, that's the question number one for you. Dr. Lichten, Lichten, I, the question for you is the fact that your antibody is directed at the FC segment or the FC tail of IgG and it doesn't appear to be sensitive to, or specific, I should say, to um, uh, antibodies that are directed at the um, PRA, what would, why wouldn't that put patients at high risk for, higher risk for infection for short, even short or extended period of time? And last, Dr. Sika, the question for you, <laughs> I'm sorry, is, um, wouldn't your assay of cell-free DNA also be a means to, to uh, uh, detect early AKI? Thank you. I, I can be really quick, yeah. Uh, so I didn't uh, highlight that. It's from a multivariate uh, uh, model, so it's adjusted for PRA, which would be the direct indicator of, of transfusion. So it, was it is, yes. Yes, and in the case of the, so the endopeptidase cleaves indeed IgG, so by that, for a period of seven days, there is a limited amount of, I, of less than 1% of the original amount of IgG available. Um, so it's for a limited amount of time. But so, it would be a higher risk for infection if it had gone. Let's say in the clinical study, all the patients that have undergone the procedure were hospitalized and were on, um, a prophylactic antiviral and prophylactic antibiotic. Just want to ask a question. Sure. So this is more for a living donor transplant in terms of desensitization for deceased donor because the question is when you get offers, you, the time duration is not sure they're going to come and they need it. So the window opportunity may not be. Uh, you may with one dose, how long will it last? If it's hundred percent, you, your cross match may not become negative with that. Seven days. Seven years, but the cross match would become totally negative because you're going. To, Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll test this measure of um, donor-derived cell-free DNA, so it's with the mismatch. So I think AKI, you're talking about acute kidney injury with an individual patient. So what we're measuring is the mismatch with the donor, um, with the actual recipient. Yeah, a couple of questions and a little comment. Uh, Eric, where are you guys? Phase two, phase three, any comment on outcomes? Uh, to the gentleman that presented about FAST, uh, the compliment would be I really like the linear correlation with the IOXL regarding uh, how do you look at uh, uh, volume status, your slide misses, and this is a little critique, misses examining the patient. Where is that? Listening to the lungs. I mean, you mentioned a whole bunch of ways to assume, to assess volume status. The first thing should be listen to the lungs. Is there any edema? I would probably recommend that, but that's what real doctors teach to people. Uh, and a, a general comment, everything is patient-centered. When was it different? William Mosler already said it decades ago. It's all about a patient. So we're talking again about patient-centered, patient-centered. It became a buzzword that is, too, is rather useless because we've been doing this forever, at least those of us that practice medicine. So if I, if I can address the first and then the, the last of your, your comments. So uh, we've re recently reported that we've uh, finished uh, two, two phase two trials. 
Uh, we have submitted with the European Medicines Agency in February, and at the moment we're discussing with the FDA the way forward. Uh, your comment about patient centricity, unfortunately I, I had to limit my presentation today to what I'm showing. One of the things that we're working about, and I think it goes to the comment about that it's really hard for patients to navigate through the transplant, uh, through the transplant journey. So we are working on a consortium with the AKP, with AKN and NK, NKF, um, uh, where we, uh, the program is called Transplan. Uh, it, it, there's a patient component and a physician component. And it's where we, we try to centralize everything that is available around transplant from a patient information perspective uh, and really to structure, to help people structure their, their transplant journey. So I could have chosen to go for that, for that topic. I think that's really where we as a company try to show patient centricity. One of the core elements of the program is a patient reported outcome system and caregiver reported outcome system called Backpack that we're currently working on. So we're trying to pull that all together. And this is a patient registry. Uh, this is a patient registry idea that we're also working with NKF on, on parallel, I should say. Uh, so we we're all looking in, in, in these things where the patient has the power over his or her own information. So I, I worked for a very long time for Genza and we were very proud of the registry that we started at Genza. I think there was one unfortunate flaw was that the patient never had access to their own data. So having learned from that with the company that I'm currently working with, we wanted to do things differently and that's a, our patient-centric approach where the patient is at the center of his own care and of the center of his own data. So I'll answer that question a little bit and provide a little bit more color to patient centricity. Okay. Uh, I apologize, we're running out of time. You can meet the speakers uh, uh, individually. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, another round of applause for everybody.